what are three things that we would add to the democratic platform? So the democratic platform is not sort of finally released yet. They still have to go through the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, let's say, not committee, but the, you know, the DNC co convention, I guess you could say. Um, that happens, I want to say, the week after this coming week. So we've got basically another eight or nine days until the convention actually starts. And presumably by the end of that convention, or maybe in the lead up to that convention, we will have some sort of final platform that the Democrats are running on. SDL? Just, you did see the draft that they put out. I saw that there was a draft. I haven't reviewed it yet, um, but that will just, be important. I don't know if you read the 2021, but it's very similar. It's it's almost word for word. And in fact, it includes Joe Biden in it. Like it's not updated for Kamal Harris or anything. Um, uh, are you talking about the, the platform? The the draft platform, the 2024 draft platform. Yeah, so I was, I was on the committee for that, actually. Uh -huh. um, the DNC platform. And committee. you control C, control V? <laughs> no, it's, um, it is, it is remarkably similar. There's some new stuff in there, um, but it's not necessarily the most inspiring platform in the universe. And I think they wanted to be kind of more conservative. The, the big difficulty that Democrats have is we have this commitment to not raise taxes on anybody um, uh, making under, what is it? Is it like $400,000 or something like that? You know, what is, what's the number right now? I think 400, 400 is the number. Yeah, something like that. And that means that like any of the really cool like social democratic policies, you know, that we could consider like universal pre care, universal child care, um, healthcare expansions can't really happen. You have to have some sort of like means tested minor gobbledygook. Um, so that's that's the big issue, it seems. Yeah, very. Really, I think really, it's probably politically smart. Yeah, you think it's politically smart, Micah? I think it's. I think you can't run a campaign where you're openly saying you're going to raise taxes um, on the majority of Americans because Americans are just extremely anti-tax. And I think that if you I, ever get here's to a the thing, point Micah, where there's just... When, when has this ever been tried? The only time that I can think where a politician has openly said we're going to raise taxes to provide services for you is Bernie. And that didn't seem to be like, you know, he wasn't running in a national campaign. He, this was in the Democratic primary, to be fair. But I don't think the reason he lost was because of that proposal. Like, I just, I, it's never been tried, but I feel like you could tell Americans, look, we're going to raise taxes to pay for these services. And I just don't think that would kill your campaign. I actually think that the way that th this should work is we should have um, a, a referendum. So like for the programs that I propose, like, you know, feasible social democratic reforms, we would literally just like have Congress pass as part of the bill uh, that people will have a referendum on this, which is going to be like a referential referendum. It's not actually binding, but it will basically give us the, I think the political capital we need to be able to do it because I think that people will vote for certain things. Like, um, like one of the things I'm going to propose is Medicare for kids. A lot of that's paid for by chip uh, and Medicaid, which already applies to kids. Um, so you only need, you know, 20, 30, $40 billion of Medicare contribution hikes, which is really not that much. I don't know how much it is, but it's not very much. I think people would overwhelmingly vote to raise taxes on themselves a little bit so children can have health care. Well, let's, let's go ahead. I think it's good to make the voters choose that. Let's go ahead and get into it then. So we've got the draft documents, about 80 pages, which is about four times longer than the Republican platform that they released. Sorry, platform. And does not include um, any, any requests to fire all of the, quote, woke Democrats, unquote, in the military. That's true. That's true. It's, you know, surprisingly, it's a Democratic platform, but I didn't see killing babies or pedophilia on it. I'm a little, I just, I've, I heard that's what the Democrats were all about. The, and the pedophile nothing, community is really displeased with this platform. Incredibly I, upset with this platform. You know, a key part of our base is uh, turning their backs on us, it turns out. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we have this draft, we have this draft proposal. Um, and what, essentially what we're going to talk about is three things that we would add to the proposal. Micah, you've already started off with one. You say Medicare for kids. I think it's literally absolutely the perfect policy with Tim Walls on the ticket. We're already talking about free school lunches for kids and the contrast couldn't be clearer. We want to feed kids. They don't. Um, and I think healthcare is an area where we have such deep economic issues. Um, not only is it not universal, but it's also fragmented and extremely inefficient. Um, and it's also tied to employment. 
And so these are things that need to be fixed. And I think the Medicare system is the best way to fix that. It's the best working part of our health insurance system and making people from zero to 18 eligible for Medicare, I think would be a fantastic idea. I think it also would be very popular. Tiny follow-up question. It, would this be Medicare for dependents or just for children? I, I, I don't know. Because one of the reasons I ask, I don't know if you got that, you cut out. I, I, I'm here. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, one of the reasons I ask is just part of the reason the U.S. healthcare system is so bad is even if you like healthcare markets, the U.S. system does not work well in part because you have to purchase for a whole family, which weakens the ability of like individuals to shop for the best healthcare plans. Right. If you were able to at least subset it to just adults of competent, like able-bodied, competent adults, that would at least make the market like 2% more functional, 5% more functional. So that's, that's sort of the question I was getting at. Well, I think also the employer provided aspect makes it yes. absolutely just like I mean, no, the, the employers block it up, the families block it up, and like just all this might well, make individual markets at least feasible. I, I, but I think you can understand my position. I mean, ultimately the goal for me is to make everybody eligible for Medicare. I because, agree. And, and yeah. people should understand this. 51% of people on Medicare are on a private Medicare plan. Medicare is not a single payer system. Medicare for all is actually not very radical at all. I mean, you can either have your government traditional insurance or you can swap it for private insurance. So like, even if you believe in a system where tons of people have private insurance, Medicare is still like the best functioning part of the private insurance system as well. Um, so I think it's a fan, like whatever proposal we could create that gets it to as many people as possible is what I'm in favor of. Um, I think Medicare for kids is like the most politically palatable long-term policy, but if we could expand it to also include dependents like disabled people, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think this would definitely help a lot of people. Actually, I myself had an awkward situation in my uh, you know, younger years. Uh, basically, uh, when I was a child, my grandma, she actually retired, and so she lost her union insurance. She had to go on Medicare, and that's when we found out Medicare does not cover dependent children. <laughs> At least it's very difficult for that to be the case. And so I had to have this rigmarole where it's like, oh, how do what, what do we do? You know, like we don't have health insurance for you at this point. Um, and that was, of course, very awkward. Um, and so, yeah, having Medicare for for uh, for kids and like SDL said, maybe broader dependence if you're a, an adult with a disability or something like that could probably make uh, a lot of sense. Final thoughts on this SDL before we go to our next policy. Oh, no, SDL. <laughs> Sorry, someone's printing for my printer, which is right here. Oh, um, my God. What are they printing that's so important? I'm not sure. Oh my God. I, I don't know if you can see on the, the camera, Conway might have cropped it. My sister has been making all these little um, paper Team Fortress 2 cutouts. Oh my um, God. And so they're one, they're incredibly cute, um, but she's printing out yet more of them. Oh my God. <laughs> so goodness. I'm sorry, that's what's interrupting. Adorable. Um, it is actually. So I, I mean, I, I'm totally on board with Medicare for kids. I know that some of the proposals for like Medicare for all are actually just raising the age, sort of the way that if you wanted to change the retirement age, you don't want to change it all at once. You want to sort of lead into it such that people 10 years ahead, 15 years ahead can plan for it. So you might raise it by a quarter of a year every year, or you might raise it by a fifth of a year every year. Well, you can do the same thing in the other direction. Like you can just raise the, the age that pe people can stay in Medicare, Medicaid, and just keep raising it, raising it, raising it, raising it until eventually it covers everyone. And I so mean if there's concerns it. like, oh, we're doing it too, or, or like vice versa. Like if you start from the old and you lower it, or you start from the young and you raise it, it's the same difference. Um, it's just oh, depending okay. on whether like, you're Raising the age it. you're eligible. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. You could have um, a, a two front war where you're raising the eligibility age on the younger right. end. And it's the lower on it. the middle aged. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Eventually you're going to be like 48 it, and be like, how do I still not have Medicare? God damn it. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> you're the one year, the one person. That's <laughs> yeah, economists exactly. are actually going to love that when you accidentally have a single year of people. Like the, the, the market for health insurance has completely collapsed because it's one year of the American population by accident yeah. because we did the math wrong. That's the next well, uh, Black so, Mirror episode plot. The one guy who's <laughs> just like exactly old enough to not have Medicare still. Yeah. <laughs> the worst Black Mirror episode ever. Going to the doctor and not having to pay in cash. Unbelievable. Um, I, I will just say something that I've mentioned before is that um, the effects of Medicare, Medicaid on young people are particularly important. So I, 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 I often talk about crime and public safety um, because it's one of the areas that liberals and leftists do the worst on politically. The best way to run as a conservative is to say that you hate immigrants and you hate crime and you're going to crack down on both with a big boot of the state. So how do we get ahead of that? Well, one answer is that you want to try and find the ways to cut crime and tie your social policies to cutting crime. Medicare, Medicaid has an enormous reduction on crime among 
among people who have mental illnesses, for example. Just being able to get access to therapy and SSRIs and regular doctor treatment has a like 25 to 40 percent reduction in rates of crime among those who have a mental disorder of some kind. And there's similar but smaller effects among people who do not have disorders. Um, like it's in fact, if anything, the population of people like below 30, if you want to reduce crime, that's the area where all your welfare should be targeting. And it works. It's an enormous crime reducer. So I just, look, yeah, I'm, I have, I'm tough on crime. We need to fund the fuck out of those children. Okay. Yeah. I have on next policy I have on my list. It's a very similar, of course, to Micah. So I think overall, probably the my biggest disappointment in Joe Biden as president, um, of course, it's opportunity cost, right? So he did a lot of positive things. I don't know if Joe Biden's done much that I would consider just like bad, strictly bad. But the biggest missed opportunity is right after a global pandemic, we had basically no major healthcare reform. We had some negotiation on drug prices, which, you know, you could argue is 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 major, but I mean, it's really not right. And um, it's 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 not major relative to the policies we could have passed. And obviously, Joe Biden ran on, you know, a health care reform platform like he had health care reform as part of his platform. And for some reason, when he actually got into office, there was just literally no serious discussion on actually doing major health care reforms. I think what the Democrats should add to their platform is just a Medicare buy in. So a little bit further than what Mike has described, um, basically just make everyone eligible for Medicare if they want it, right? So to, you know, Pete Buttigieg, Medicare for all who want it. Um, but I think that's a good step ladder. I think it's politically relatively viable because you're not getting rid of the totally private healthcare market. Um, you can get rid of some things that are arguably unpopular. Like for instance, I've always said that I feel like a lot of veterans would probably prefer to be on Medicare automatically than to have to deal with VA coverage. Um, and so if veterans wanted to uh, basically utilize Medicare instead of be on veterans uh, insurance, then that would be pretty popular. I mean, you could do you could do that relatively easily. You could just say, oh, the premiums that you pay for Medicare, they just go to zero if you're a veteran. You can be on Medicare for free and just pay whatever the copays and stuff. If you're a veteran, I think that would be pretty popular. And obviously this would cover children as well. Micah's policy is just a little bit more incremental than my policy, but um, I think that overall the theme that we're getting here is like there's a lot of room for some pretty big healthcare reforms. Oh, one advantage also of the Medicare for all buy-in is that you can also get rid of Medicaid. You don't, you don't need Medicaid yeah, anymore. Yeah, you can just merge them all, which is yeah, a um, huge... And, and Medicaid can... being state administered makes it worse because Republicans are dog shit at administering state administered programs because they don't want poor people to have welfare. They don't want poor people to have government assistance and Medicare being a federally administered program automatically makes poor people in all red states have much better access to health care. So I think a broad Medicare buy-in makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I think another important point is it basically would automatically expand um, health care access in red states because in states like Texas, we didn't expand Medicaid. And so yep. if you had it as a federal program, we could expand it. Now, I think this is really two different policies. This is like merging tons of programs into Medicare and also having a buy-in. I think a buy-in is a great idea, but there's a really important thing that needs to be included. And it actually wasn't included in a lot of people's presidential platforms. We need to make sure subsidies apply to these Medicare plans, right? So like if our ACA tax credit, which is basically a tax credit, which caps premiums at a certain percentage of your income, uh, on the individual mar state marketplaces doesn't apply to Medicare, then it's not gonna, like, Medicare is gonna be much more expensive than your Affordable Care Act plans. Similarly, um, we need to make sure that businesses can not buy their employees insurance, can contribute to an employee's personal account, a uh, personal healthcare expenditures account, and they can use that money on a Medicare plan. So we need to make sure that all of our existing subsidies end up applying to these Medicare plans so they're cost effective. And, I mean, like actually cost competitive. Yeah, exactly. I, I think say, um, the the actual proposal would, of course, be um, a little bit more complex than just like lowering the Medicare age. Uh, SDL? I just did want to say, if you want an area to criticize Tim Walls, actually, it's that um, under Walls, Minnesota passed one of the first in the country sort of public option buy-ins, but they passed it as a thing that can be enacted, like they authorized it, but it needs the governor to push it through, and he delayed on it. Um, so it hasn't been started yet. Now it might start as he gets replaced. It might, he might do it before he leaves, but that actually is a thing that I was really pissed about because I think three Dem states have passed these piddling small public options that are like privately administered and not sufficiently funded. Um, but this was like the first step towards something like Medicare, Medicaid buy-in. Um, 
And it just, it's not happening. And again, I feel like this is a thing that's really easy to for Dems to run on if they actually just do it. Um, yeah, well, I, Jared think, Polis, I think his problem is that yeah, many, the states that have enacted public options have not really seen a ton of success. Um, and it's because I think the idea that people have regarding what a public option is supposed to do is wrong. The reason why we want to buy in into Medicare is because we want to consolidate our healthcare system eventually into one unified system. A public option often is just creating an entirely new small insurance company administered by your state, which has well, no economy of scale, creates even more fragmentation that's, than we have. That's before. actually that's my point. The three Dem states that did it, they did that piddling little private insurance. Right. But Minnesota did the first in the country, to my knowledge, that is a public option buy-in, is my point. Like you would buy into Medicare, Medicaid, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Buying into Medicaid is right. Like these, yes. some of these other some some states have proposed. I don't know what Minnesota plan to do, but a lot of times they just create an entirely new government insurance option. It's like, no, yeah, no, no. So Medicaid, all the, th Medicaid. all the three of them states that did it, they, they create a new government agency yeah. and then it pays a private company just to run a right. new insurance system. All you're doing there is subsidizing the insurance market. You can just do that to people directly, right? There's, that's yeah. not a public just option. Just like really. reinsurance or something, man. Like it's really not, yes. why would you do it this so, way? <laughs> uh, the reason I bring it up is I think Minnesota is the closest we have to a real trial at a public option in the US. And I just wish, please press the button, Mr. Walls, please. Uh, please press the Medicaid, healthcare man. button. It's, it's really not hard. Um, it's really not. SDL, what should the Democrats add to their platform? So I was focused on ideas that could be politically feasible. So something that interested me, and we've talked about it occasionally, um, we actually just mentioned sectoral bargaining. So the first state in the country last year, California passed what I would call provisional first step sectoral bargaining. Um, California passed a wage board. Now, previous wage boards have either been limited to exactly one sector or have only had recommendation policy. And usually both. So I think about eight Dem states have passed some sort of recommendation-based single sector board. It'll be like, for healthcare workers, we're going to have a meeting of labor and labor activists and businesses and the public. And we're going to sit down and figure out what hours and pay are useful. And then they submit a report to Congress. Okay, that's like fine, but that's just another committee, basically, right? It's a committee where you've invited expert speakers from the labor movement and from the business side. Okay, um, that's not really sectoral bargaining or a wage board, like it was supposed to be back in like the FDR days. Um, two states have actually passed something like a real wage board. Again, Minnesota, actually. Minnesota, under walls and with the, the Dems, passed a single sector wage board that has, has actual policy setting authority. It's the first in the country, to my knowledge, to do that. And they did it in 2020, too. And then California in 2023, under glorious comrade Newsom, passed the closest to genuine sectoral bargaining, like a first step towards it in the country. Um, I can pull up the name of it, but I believe it's like the industrial uh, stability boards or something along those lines. And so they can set minimum wages and our guarantees, like at uh, um, like overtime amounts in specific sectors, just basically specific regulations on the conditions of work and the wages of work in sectors. So that's really interesting because it provides a much better way of targeting the minimum wage. Um, and it's a way to boost the size of unions. Like virtually every study that's looked at sectoral bargaining finds that it boosts the size of unions by bringing them into this power structure that applies to everyone in a sector. So you want to be in the union if you want to have power. Um, so I just bring it up because this is a thing that... I've seen so the, the plenty of centrist Dem like think tanks have been talking about sectoral bargaining, but it would be great to see Dems just put it into their platform. Like unironically, uh, Joe Biden, I believe, in one of his statements, talked about the importance of sectoral bargaining. Um, I just just make it official. Just put it in. Say, Comrade Newsom, we thank you for your service to the People's Republic, uh, and we're going to talk about sectoral bargaining the platform now. I would be pretty concerned um, about that proposal, um, and it's just because of. I think what we've learned from countries like France, where you have really low union densities um, and you also have sectoral bargaining, you know, whenever the unions for a sector are bargaining uh, a sectoral contract, they're bargaining on behalf of their members. Mm -hmm. They're not bargaining on behalf of the interests of the entire sector. And so the best contract for the workers in those unions is not always the best contract for the sector. They often don't represent the sector. I and do so you know. Can get that, that create tons of rigidity and create unemployment. That's what we've seen in Italy. That's what we've seen in France. What we've seen in a lot of southern European countries. So your problem is not had, um, and you know, the Scandinavian countries because union density is so high. Well, but I, I will just add part of the reason for that is due to policy designs in French sectoral versus Nordic sectoral bargaining. So in the particular one that's been highlighted in my readings is that French sectoral bargaining places very little benefit to people to joining a union. So because the union contract basically covers the whole sector, 
and because you don't face any harms from not paying a due to the union, pretty much people just don't pay dues to the union. That's sort of simplified. Um, so I, we can speak to the exact design of the policy. I, I do agree there's concerns there, but maybe if I want to put it like this, if you want to achieve a world where you have the Nordic sectoral bargaining, you need the first step of actually having the sectoral bargaining because we need to get the union density numbers higher to even get to the point where we're at the point where like 80% coverage is a concern. Right. I think that, I, that I think that on these wage boards as well, there's oftentimes state representation. So it's yeah. not just like the yeah, capital. Yeah, wage labor board interest. isn't really sectoral bargaining, but it actually yes, makes this, a lot this more is sense a first step it. towards it. Is is, is was my point? Um, I I think wage boards make um, a lot more like Australian style wage boards probably make a lot more sense with low union densities. Um, but I I think you're talking about the idea of like tying unemployment insurance to unions, right? Uh, I have not supported in, the Denmark uh, doesn't do that actually, but. Uh, no, no I, I'm not. I'm not actually sure about sure about that system. This one in particular is just the, the wage boards as done in California. Like you can look it up in their website. Um, all they do is set minimum wages and hours and like various guarantees around yeah, that. Well, wage boards are actually much less problematic. So I, yeah. I do like you. You are right. There are some concerns with sort of sectoral bargaining in the U.S. Uh, firm level union context that like may or may not work out. I, I'm totally on board with that. I just, this, I don't think has any of those concerns. And yeah. again, if we want to get to a point where unions are powerful enough that we can talk about real sector oil bargaining, that we, these are like a necessary intermediate. My, my only concern with wage boards is the specific institutional design. I know in Australia, you'll have people campaign on what the wage board will do. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure everybody gets a 4% wage hike or the like. Australians, please. Feel free to slaughter me if I'm getting this incorrectly. Um, and so I'd be concerned about that board becoming politicized and setting contracts and rules based on politics and not actual labor market conditions. I mean, ideally, the purpose of the wage board is to correct for market failures of you know, wages being set too low because of asymmetries in bargaining power and information. And so we'd want, it's really important that we design the institution to actually be pursuing that yeah. I mean, we have, so just for uh, one last note on this, maybe before we move to the next one, um, a lot of wage boards are called tripartite wage boards because they're supposed to have three parties involved, the employers, the workers, and the public in some broad sense. And usually the public is the state, like the, the local uh, state government. It is possible, and this is not something that California is pursuing, it is possible to just replace the public with, you guessed it, a sortition selected group of public citizens hey. who, are not, who are not necessarily concerned about, about these. Um, you gonna put that in the platform? <laughs> <laughs> Democratic sortition platform expansion. plank number fourteen. Sortition is based. Yeah. End of policy. Sortitioned platform. wage boards. Okay, I'm on board. I'm sold. <laughs> All right, Micah. Policy number two from your list. What should the Dems add? So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to say the entire For the People Act. Um. So for for those of you who don't know, uh, whenever Democrats won a trifecta in 2020, the first resolution that the house put forward was the for the people act uh, called hr1 and it was genuinely fantastic it made election day a national holiday it made uh, early voting universal it required independent redistricting and banned gerrymandering nationwide um, it promoted automatic voter registration and required all states to allow people to register voters online I'm telling, like, this is a genuine overhaul of our democratic institutions for the better and to protect people from uh, voter suppression. And I think all of these things are extremely popular and all of them pay long-term dividends. Um, I genuinely think that if Democrats win this time around, we need institutional reform. We need to make D.C. and Puerto Rico states. We need to protect people's voting rights. And we need to take out things like gerrymandering, which just decrease the quality of representation around the country. Um, so I think no, we no, should Micah, absolutely... The court's just going to rule it on. unconstitutional. What's the point? Uh, I'm being I, genuine. I don't think so. <laughs> I hope you don't not. Think, you don't think the court would rule everything you just said unconstitutional? I don't think so. I, don't I think, think so. so, man. The Supreme Court is biased, but we've actually seen some rulings out of them that like show that I don't think they're... I think that they believe that there's some basis in law for the rulings. I don't think they're being entirely arbitrary. They just, I have, they have two complete nut cases that I don't think care at all. Clarence Thomas. I mean, they and, seem, they um, seem Alito. to have limited every time there's a voting rights act case, they seem to always side on like getting rid of the voting rights act protections. And I just feel like, you know, 
and that like, was we were if, before the trump court right yeah like i just feel like if the if there was a bill that got passed that said like oh states are required to do nonpartisan like uh districting they're gonna be like no states have the constitutional right to gerrymander as much as they fucking want you know it's like i don't know it could be wrong but Get, I mean, there's, there's trying, so many provisions. There's no way they're going to strike down every single provision. And every single one of the provisions is super good. We'll get some of them. <laughs> Maybe. Be. I, an additional thing that I want to add, Kam Kamala has previously made comments to the tune of overriding the filibuster to pass a Voting Rights Act. And also to pass, I believe, the PRO, Protecting the Right to Organize Act. So I've wondered, the Democratic draft platform does not mention the filibuster whatsoever. So you were talking about getting this to the Supreme Court. I don't know that it, something like this would get out of Congress. So yeah, I mean, is that something that you think should be like attached to this kind of thing, Micah? Like, you don't have to say abolish the filibuster. Maybe that's too far. Maybe people aren't ready for it yet. Your kids will be, though. Um, but just to say abolish, override the filibuster where it comes to civil rights or something along those lines. Like, couch it like that. I don't think most people know what the filibuster is. To the extent that people understand what it is. Um, I don't think people are uniformly against it, at least for people that are, it's salient to. And I only sure. have one example for this. My father, um, he, he's you know, now convinced that the Democrats are the lesser of the two evils. Uh, but he has told me that a lot of this st stuff was contributed to by the fact that Harry Reid did a carve out on the filibuster. And so he's like, you know, Democrats kind of made this whole situation worse. And I mean, obviously I think it's ridiculous because I think Democrats, I mean, Republicans have been incredibly bad faith um for, since at least the year 2000 um but i i don't think it's a popular thing to campaign on of course it's something that we should do sure yeah i mean like micah said at the very least if the court rules a lot of that bill unconstitutional at least not all of it probably right you know we'll get some good stuff <laughs> ideally crazy um, to all of it unconstitutional i would not i just wouldn't be surprised micah well anyway next up on my list Let's talk about number two. Um, so one thing that the Democrats have kind of, you know, they've given some lip service to, but I'd like to see, and it doesn't look, we're, I get that we're policy wonks here and we'd love to see a thousand page, like point by point plan on everything that the Dems are exactly going to propose, right? Um, that's not going to happen. But on housing, the Democrats need like a short little thing on housing um with numbers behind it and maybe some basic things that they could do um i i said uh housing affordability you could say 10 or 20 million new homes now that might sound insane in a four-year period but that's only an increase of like five or ten percent of the housing stock like it's entirely doable with the right set of policies um, and you could have a three to five point plan on like just some basic things that we're going to try to do in order to accomplish this goal, which is actually quite moderate if you think about it. Um, so here's some things that I've suggested. Number one, heavily incentivize liberalization of zoning, right? You know, just offer a truckload of money to cities who have liberalized zoning laws. You can have a point system and say, if you have these aspects of your zoning model uh, achieved, you get this much money as a grant incentive. Um, I think something like that could make a lot of sense. You could also do a, a, a stick approach and basically just say, unless you liberalize your zoning, you're going to lose this funding. Um, and I think most cities would say, well, it's probably not worth listening to the NIMBYs if it means losing like hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. And if they make that choice, then, you know, God bless them, I guess. I mean, that'd be ridiculous. But I think a positive incentive would probably be better anyway. Next up, just take the take the the public housing water tap and just turn it all the way on right so just invest a lot of money into building public housing i think when you combine that with liberalization of zoning in a lot of areas it's actually easier to build public housing as well right and so you can start actually making real investments in public housing coordinated investments hopefully federally administered again do not let state don't just give state governments money for public housing because then republican states will somehow find a way to put that money into like anti-abortion you know clinics or some stupid shit right it's like don't do that federally administered public dollars going to building affordable housing i think something like that would make well, a lot of sense yeah go on micah it's actually all in there where is it micah where's the tens of billions of dollars in affordable housing so biden's plan uh, yeah. It's one of the few plans he actually announced, and it was in the platform because, of course, I read the housing section. 
uh, was 1.5 million to 2 million homes, not 20 million or not 10 million. Not um, far enough. It she achieved via new housing construction and um, uh, renovations. A lot of demand side subsidies, but there is a line in there that made me feel better about myself, which is incentivize like local governments to, it didn't say deregulate or anything like that, but it basically said this, like, change the rules for like pro housing development rules that's the thing yeah. like i mean if, if we, you're like one if or you're two million, that micah then i feel like the previous proposal you had is mostly in the democratic platform right i, I well really quick though i was gonna say Ooh. that like one or two million new houses is like a one percent increase in the amount of houses like it's just like this is nothing right. this is not a big right. deal right like democrats one thing that um one thing that Anthony Albanese, prime minister of Australia, said when he was running for office to be prime minister um, in 2022, I think it was when he got elected, um, he said that labor wins when labor does big, bold policies, right? And Democrats, I think, could use a little courage, right? Like, I'm sick of like what you described at the very start of this, where it's like, Oh yeah, we're we're not gonna raise anyone's taxes, and we're we're not gonna do any welfare because welfare. It's like guys, stop being cowards about who you are. This is one reason I liked Tim Walls so much. He said welfare is good. We need to give welfare to people. It's a good thing when people don't live in poverty, and welfare does that, right? We need to stop being cowards. We need to say we're gonna build twenty million houses. We're going to extend healthcare access to tens of millions of people. And yeah, we might raise taxes to pay for those things. That's just the deal here. You got the fascists and you got the guys who want to raise tax revenue to build public services and welfare programs for people. If that's really a message that cannot win against fascism in this country, I, okay, I don't know. We're just doomed as a country then. We can never do anything, it turns out. Um, and so, you know, I, to get the housing policy just slightly more bold. Instead of a 1% increase, let's do 10%. Like, that's basically what I'm suggesting here, right? And if that's not moderate enough for the Democrats, then we just need new Democrats, right? I think Kamala and Tim Walls would be open to more, hopefully more bold messaging in this regard. I will say, I, I do broadly agree with the Albanese quote that I think part of the reason Sanders was able to run, despite being relatively unknown, is because he ran on a few policies that people tied to him. So everyone knows Medicare for all now. Like everyone who's politically tuned in knows Medicare for all. Everyone knows $15 minimum wage. Because of AOC, everyone knows Green New Deal, right? You have some ability to be a, a the term sometimes used as policy entrepreneur, to bring a policy into the mainstream just by talking about it, just by making a part of the conversation. And I don't know that any by that any Democrat has recently been successful in doing that in like the center of the party. Like I don't know if there's a single policy that people would tie to Joe Biden as his signature goal as his his signature attempts people might tie like obamacare but he didn't run on obamacare right so i, I do I, I do actually think this is a big value it's one of the reasons that i would like mr walls to please press the healthcare now button and hope to have done it one year ago and to be able to be like hey i want a public option for the whole country i actually really like that they're talking about child tax credits and um the feeding the children because these are policies that they can actually just be like let's just do this everywhere let's just give parents money <laughs> Um, and it should be a winning message because most parents like money, but it also is a, like a powerful message to tie to a person as a, a reason to vote for them rather than just reason to vote against the other guy. I, I agree. Oh, I the, think that we, we've uh, had an issue with um, lack of political courage where we don't stake out a position as a party and just fight for it. Um, and I think the idea is, okay, maybe in the short run, you lose some people. In the long run, it becomes really important because that's what energizes your base. That's what motivates people to vote for your party. You can't just motivate people by saying we're marginally better than the alternative. We need to have big ideas. Right. And look at mass deportations for Republicans. I mean, they've been able to take this extremely radical and intuitively unpopular position and made it probably looks like the majority position in the United States just by beating the drum. Can we not do that for giving health care to everybody? Like, seriously, is this is this yeah. something like a position that's too risky for us to take out? I really don't think so. And the last thing that I had on my like housing agenda, this is just some look, people are going to flame me for this. OK, I don't want to hear it. This is the Democratic platform. This isn't like the most wonky policies. Just throw in banning private, you know, equity and corporate ownership of single family homes. Look. Here's the thing cringe. to everyone who hates. Look, Micah, cringe. I get what you're saying. No it's cringe, okay? But here's the thing, okay? It literally doesn't make that big of a difference. And it's just something that, like, I think idea. a lot of people are, they like, 
you know, there's there's a reason why Kamala Harris talks about getting rid of price gouging and stuff like that in her stump speech. It's a popular message, right? And I'm willing for the people saying boo in the chat. I love your boos. Give them to me. Okay. And Micah, you too. The reason I think this is effective is because this is a party platform, right? You have to get it elected. And in exchange, Micah, let me, let me, let me ask you this. In exchange for broad liberalization of zoning, 10, 20 million uh, public housing developments being started and completed, you wouldn't take banning corporate ownership of single family the, the, homes. That's not the trade-off. The utilitarian the calculus is there. Whenever you say that's a solution, people think that doing that is a solution and you don't need to do the other stuff. It's not a concession. Whenever she campaigns on rent control, people think rent control actually will solve our rental market issues. And so they don't think the alternatives are. And that has effects down ballot too. Democrats in cities are more likely to do this. Here's policies. my question on Democrats Micah. In states. I'm more likely to Here's do my direct policies. question: If if campaigning on rent control, let's say that let's say Kamala was current, let's say we could divine into the universe where it's November fifth, Kamala's losing by ten thousand votes in Wisconsin, and that's the difference between winning and losing. Let's say that we knew for a fact if she advocated for rent, rent control strongly, she ends up winning that election, winning the election. Would you advocate Ooh. for her putting that on her platform oh, sure. if we knew that to be the case? Well, that's no, what I'm, I'm saying. That's all we, I'm saying. I'm, I think this is an effective political message, basically. But, but here's, here's the thing, uh, Cameron. My issue with this kind of thinking is it assumes that only the bad policies are the ones that can be really popular. But the reality is there's an infinite number of extremely good policies that are also popular. Infinite. Uh, the wonks is not to do the lazy thing, which political strategists do, which is say, yeah, just pick every bad policy in the universe that sounds like sort of <laughs> good. No, no, no. Let's find this subset of po policies that are actually good and sound good. Because the goal of politics is not just to beat the really crazy fascist people, it's to make the world a better place. I understand what you're saying. I think we we really truthfully have quite a marginal disagreement here. Um, I just think that this would be something that would be popular to add in. And to be fair, look, there's a shitload of things As on platforms that you run on and win on, and you just don't do, i.e. Biden and implementing a public option. So this could just be one of those things you run on, and then we just kind of quietly forget about it when we actually take office you know i wouldn't mind that myself uh, sdl okay, final thoughts on this i sadly forgotten about the public option um I just as a as the real socialist here and the lover of big capital i think we should just invert economy boy's suggestion to make it so that single family homes can only be owned by equity capital thus abolishing sure. the private home bourgeoisie that's true <laughs> i agree sdl what's your policy number two that democrats should add <laughs> so they have an education section in the the policies but it's very similar to the 2021 and it's filled with a lot of like some stuff is, is pretty radical and some stuff is pretty moderate so just to go through sort of by age um there's already a child care subsidy that they propose but they want to do it through a block grant system which everyone uh, on this show hates fringe. so federalize that um two i would like to see those the child care, I would like to see some of that be built into elementary schools. You're talking about building more housing. We should also just be building more schools. Um, and many of these schools can be integrated sites. Think about it as a parent. You are very likely to have two children who are of elementary and pre-elementary age or elementary and post-elementary age. If you have an elementary and pre-elementary, how nice is it to go to school and drop all of your kids off? You've got all the way from zero to like whatever that 12 or whatever at you, the end of like K to six. If it was one facility, this would be a godsend to the average American. And it's also a way to try and plan for lower density and fewer commutes. The average American spends like twice as much time commuting as people in other countries. Just put it in one place. I just want the public child care and the public K-12 in the edge in the schools. So whether I can, we can say that in the democratic platform, probably not, but I would just like to say federalize the, 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 the child care funding. Um, they talk about having universal pre-K. Again, you'd want to federalize that funding. I'd like to in incorporate into elementary schools. That's like the younger stuff. Interestingly, the Dem platform already has support for free community colleges and free trade schools. This isn't actually as radical as it sounds. Something like a third of red states have enacted free community colleges. It's remarkable how much the average policy has shifted on this in the past like 10 years. So I've long been in the position, and even economy has been in the positions, just make all public colleges free. Just, just go the whole hog, right? Why stop with community colleges? If the goal there is to encourage people to go to community colleges, just have it be that community colleges are a plus on your application record to public colleges, something like that. Like, there are other ways to incentivize people to go to community colleges if that's your concern. Um, 
all of it should just be free. And I, I bring this up actually, if, if you want to spin on it, Micah, that, that I, I kind of liked recently, China produces about four times more STEM graduates than America does every single year. We're falling China. behind in the war for mines, for literally producing mines. So simply, we need to double the number of STEM graduates in this country by, say, doubling the number of people who go to colleges. And how are you going to get that? Except by building out public colleges. We need 1,000 more of them. We need 4,000 more of them. And we need them to be free so that everyone who wants can go there and everyone can get their drinky dinky little mechanical engineering degree they can get their woohoo i'm so cool physical nuclear sciences degree woohoo so cool it's beautiful okay i have two Thank words you. for you sdl signaling theory um <laughs> you folks, think it's, it, the working class people and like lower income people are not going to like it is that it or no, no, signaling theory why why do people who get degrees get paid more I believe that overwhelmingly the evidence indicates that it's because the degree signals something about them. It doesn't teach them necessarily useful skills that increase their productivity on the job. Now, of course, there's exceptions. Engineers, I believe only 4% of people who graduate uh, from a four-year uh, from a four-year program and you have a bachelor's degree graduate from an engineering program. So the reality is if you just throw more money at subsidizing demand for universities, Yes, more people will go. Um, will those people have their lives meaningfully enriched? Not necessarily, actually. If you fully believe in signaling theory, that would actually just cause credential inflation, which means that, yes, more people would have degrees, but the wage premium for degrees would go down in the same proportion. I think, fundamentally, if people were proposing the German uh, higher education system, which does include free college, that would be one thing. But none of the free college um, Proposals we've seen in this country have been even close to as sophisticated. In Germany, they determine the number of skilled professionals they need beforehand and then fund seats accordingly. So they say we needed 500,000 engineers. We're going to fund, fully fund 500,000 engineering seats. And their programs are three years, not four years. And furthermore, apprenticeships, on the job training, other forms of workforce development are equally funded. So you're not distorting people in terms of their decision making towards colleges in a way from maybe potentially more cost effective um, and uh, uh, beneficial forms of training. So if that was the proposal, I, I think that would be fine. I think that'd be pretty popular. Uh, but it's just, just zeroing out tuition is um, not the best idea in the universe. I mean, I know you and I have agreed on signaling theory in the past. So like that's, that's just sort of hard to get around. Um, but um, on the, the other reforms, I think those are fair, but just also something that the federal government can't really set. Like the structure of most of the public universities is going to be set by the states. If you want, if we want to call for federalizing them, I mean, we can go right ahead and then we can have a proper German system. You just condition on funding, you know, just like, hey, I mean, okay, if you want our money, you have to do it this way. You've got to, you've got to have your three-year engineering degrees. Um, I, I guess just, just more broadly, it, it, it seems hard I, I don't know. I, I feel like the, the heart of this disagreement is just around signaling, honest to God. Um, like, I am so convinced that years in education is a direct correlate of, like, reductions of crime, reductions, of, like, increases in intelligence, increases in, like, innate, quote-unquote, ability. Um, that should persist across all jobs, even regardless of signaling. And then I do believe there is specific learning. You, you may be right that colleges, like, it is possible that the blend of degrees offered is not the, like, economy-optimizing mix, and maybe you would want to condition funding based on that, right? College is free, but we're only offering X many seats, and so if you want to get into the arts program, like, you better be really good. Um, that's possibly wow. tenable, but I do think that, like, honestly, Rejecting God, people from an arts program? Risky. So the, the, the signaling uh, theory is, is very much grounded in evidence. I, look, I invite you to look into the uh, sheepskin effect, um, which shows that if you complete every single college credit, you know, 119 credits, and you just miss your last one, and you don't graduate with a degree, it's almost as if you didn't never went to college. Now, if it was true that college was making you much more productive, but, then it wouldn't matter if you completed that, that last credit. You completed all this education. Why, are you, why is this not happening? Sure, but part of the signaling theory is that employers are dealing with limited information, right? Employers are dealing with limited information. And if they see that you don't have a degree, they're not going to be like, oh, you got 119 credits. I guess I'll count that and consider the courses. They're looking that you got that degree because it's a signal that you were completing it. I agree, right. that's a signal, right? But that, the, the problem is not necessarily that they're not doing better. It's that employers are basing their decisions on that signal. Like that's that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, well that explains the wage premium. But here's we, we can look at 
um, educational research to determine how much people that uh, are learning that's relevant. And the reality is the vast majority of people who go to college end up getting a job in a program, uh, getting a job that's not directly related to their college program. I think it's only like 47% of people get a job that is even related to the program they sit in college. Um, your major is what, 30% of the credits that you get in order to graduate. Most of the courses don't even relate to your major, so they're not even related to your job at all. And retention rates for the information you learn in courses that are not directly relevant to what you do every single day is extremely low. Within two I mean, years, I you forget almost everything you learn. Last, so like there is- Last word on this, Michael, when you're finished, SDL, and then we'll, we'll have to move on. We gotta, we yeah. gotta get through these. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I just think, I mean, obviously education is important. Um, I think higher education access is really important. I think the student debt crisis is something that needs to be addressed and the system needs to be overhauled. I think that the people who say, let's just throw more money at the existing system, I think it's uninspiring. I don't think that solves a lot of our problems. Um, and I think we need to do much better. That's the last the word. I want to add, move on. You know, my completely insane position, which cannot go into the Democratic Party <laughs> policy platform, is that I would actually like the accelerated, very specific skills based college programs and then lifelong college for free for everyone. Um, like that, I think, is one of the solutions to get sort of the general education concerns just shift it further into people's lifespans, right? You get people the degrees they need, the, need, the skills they need, they get a job. Well, now they can go off studying how to be a model citizen for the next 80 years of their life before we put them into like the resuscitation vats or whatever. Um, yep. Next topic. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, we have Micah's third and final policy. Micah, what would you add to the DNC national platform if it was just Micah in charge? I think, I think tax reform. Um, is a good idea. Um, for a long time, I've advocated for us ending itemized deductions in favor of raising the standard deduction, um, you know, the, the standard amount that people can minus from their taxable income and also in increasing the child tax credit. And I think that's probably popular. Um, now, you can make a little bit less specific um, for popularity reasons, right? Close tax loopholes to raise the standard deduction for families and the child tax credit. I genuinely think that Raising the standard deduction is a position that we haven't taken in the past. It's also one that's just really popular. Um, and it's a good one. So I, I think that's something that we should campaign on. Also, Democrats for tax breaks. If we're saying we're not going to raise your taxes, we're actually going to lower your taxes. I think that's pretty overpowered. Right. Actually, thematically similar is my next thing. We can kind of group these together. I think the Democrats could, could absolutely uh, dig out a lane of debureaucratization, right? So in addition to tax, you know, making taxes simpler and also more progressive at the same time. So that's always the caveat here. We had some commenter on one of our videos saying you guys are all right wing because you're not in favor of the corporate tax. And it's like, I tried to explain to the guy, like our proposals would lead to rich people paying more taxes. Like you'd get more money from rich people and distribute it to poor people if you did our tax proposals, he was like, you guys are right wing. You just want to get rid of it. It's like, all right, dumbass. I guess if you want to live your fucking life in this weird, you know, vacuum of where corporate taxes are a value, that's one thing. But I don't think that's necessary. I think you can have smart tax policy that's also highly progressive. But again, on the on the distribution side, I think you can advocate for debureaucratization. So what do I mean by that? Um, you can be the party of small government while advocating for welfare expansion. How do you do this? You make it cash focused. Get rid of all these, you know, not all of them, obviously, but get rid of a lot of these in-kind constrained benefits. Make make food stamps a cash program. Just say, hey, this is your this is your food allowance, but it's really just cash. Like we're gonna give you three hundred dollars a month. We're gonna say it's for food, but really it's just cash. You know, you can call it a. We're gonna get rid of food stamps and give you a basic assistance allotment or something like that give everyone $300 a month, boom, get rid of food stamps. And that means, guess what? You can fire everyone who works for the food stamp administration. There's no reason to have those employees anymore. Now, obviously, are you really firing them? Not all of them. A lot of them are probably going to get reassigned to other more hopefully productive uh, means of government employment, but it's a lot of debureaucratization. Okay, you can do that as well. Um, you can also centralize the administration of welfare significantly just make welfare programs, which are now cash-based, make all of them administered by the Social Security Administration. Hey. They basically have, the the reason you would do that is because the Social Security Administration distributes trillions of dollars of cash benefits a year to Americans, uh, people with disabilities, 
elderly people for the most part. Um, some dependents uh, are eligible for uh, cash assistance uh, from Social Security as well. And everyone has a Social Security number, so it just kind of, you know, it just kind of makes sense. Take that child tax credit allowance, administer it through Social Security, make it federal, do the same thing with food stamps. Um, you could do the same thing with housing assistance, get rid of that, just make it cash assistance if you want. Um, you can also means test it if you want, uh, but just, it, you know, Basically, if we have a cash assistance program, make it administered through the Social Security Administration. That de-bureaucratizes our system significantly, gives the Social Security Administration more responsibility, but it's responsibility in a thing that they're really, really good at, right? It's like giving cash to people who are entitled to it. Um, one thing as well that I think you could do in order to get rid of a lot of different welfare programs and different like, you know, administrative employment nonsense is... Um, just broaden the base of the EITC. I don't think we're going to get like a really, really good, uh, you know, basic income anytime soon, uh, universal basic income to people anytime soon. You can maybe do a small one, like, oh, we're going to get rid of food stamps and give everyone $300 a month or something like that. But I think that your best bet right now is just broadening the base of the earned income tax credit. Get rid of the trapezoid structure. For those that don't know, the EITC is basically a trapezoid shape where the you get more EITC the more money you make up to a certain point, and then it flattens out at certain income levels, and then it starts to go down as you earn a lot of income. Now, you might ask yourself, why would a poverty reduction program require that you make income? That doesn't make sense. It's because the Democrats for a long time had this view, and Republicans as well, that basically we shouldn't give money to people who should be working. Now, this idea has kind of gone by the wayside in large part, not in not in, in total part, to be clear. But something you could do for the earned income tax credit is just take that trapezoid structure and just make it a, a full, you know, anybody at any income level, whether you file taxes or not, whether you're working or not, gets that basic tax credit. Um, and that could be a basic income essentially for lower income people. And then it starts to fall off at a certain income level. That would be hugely um a good at reducing poverty and it would de-bureaucratize our system if we got rid of a lot of the other programs that we have for giving people money who need it. Um, I just think this is something that Democrats could run on. Look, we're the, we're the party not only of less government bureaucrats, but also more poverty reduction. Republicans just seem to have gotten rid of a lot of their small government stuff that they're talking about. There's a lane there. And I think that the idea that your welfare benefits are easier to get they're more poverty reducing, they're more efficient, and we're paying a lot less pensions out to government bureaucrats. I think that's a message that could actually sell pretty well, depending on the exact wording. What do you guys think? Speechless. I win. Micah is speechless. Um, I, I don't know how much... So uh, it, my honest to God opinion is that I don't know that it, this is a salient issue to many people. At the same time... It is a useful rhetorical talking point to be like, we want efficient government. In other words, if you want to sell people on government programs, it is nice to also have the talking point that you want efficient government and the Republicans don't. The Republicans want to bloat. They want to spend all your taxpayer money on some exactly. guy in Washington who spends all his time doing paperwork. We just want to get money right to hardworking Americans like you and to more of it, unlike those greedy Republicans. That, I think, is, it can be a nice balance. Um, but I think that 90% of the popularity of that is going to come from the giving people money part of it like the the tax credit part um i think that yeah i agree with stl um welfare is not a particularly salient issue for the people that it is a salient issue too i'm not sure many of them are swing voters although maybe in states like rust belt states there's actually some conservative voters which really struggle welfare benefits so maybe a targeted message to them would be effective now that i think about it I think that welfare consolidation is the way you approach this. Like, for instance, you talked about making food stamps a cash benefit. I think long term, what you do is you take a program like food stamps, you allow them to use it on more things. You can keep your EBT card. You know, you don't have to make it actual cash. You could just make it like basically cash, but like you're not allowed to use the debit card on like, I don't know, cigarettes or something for political reasons. And then you just like sunset other programs and put all the money into that program. So you increase the benefit over time. Um, and I think you can make a pitch to specific welfare beneficiaries with a targeted message that the way that this system treats them is demeaning. Um, it is very complicated and we're not delivering them the kind of support that they need. And we're the ones who actually understand the issues that they're struggling with and we want to fix it. Because it is true, like welfare recipients, I mean, we treat them terrible in this country. Um, th this yeah. system is, 
is generally awful. So I think a targeted message to them could be effective. I agree. Tax reform, tax simplification, and more progressivity and debureaucratization. Final thoughts on that, SDL, before we go to your final policy that you would add to the DNC, what would you say? I mean, I think that's all That's all I really have to add to it. Um, I, I, I think that one unfortunate thing is that means testing in, in, in messaging tests that are sent out of, would you like this welfare program? Okay, well, would you like it if it was means tested? Generally, means testing does seem to increase popularity. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Like, in other words, I think this is a good, as good framing you're going to get on making something universalized because we are running against a slight disadvantage that the average person seems to like means testing. That, that's be all I'd say. So the, my response to that, I actually, again, Matt Brunig, just Matt, write a book with your entire political philosophy <laughs> and that'll be my new Bible for God's sakes. Um, but I, I saw him, uh, I saw him talking to Brianna Joy Gray of all people. And he was, he was actually talking about this and um, the response that he had, I thought was relatively intuitive, which was, um, you know, yeah, you know, if you ask people in polls, do you like the idea, you know, hey, should should welfare programs only go to people who, uh, you know, who who make less money, right? And a lot of people will say, yeah, you know, that's great. That sounds good to me. Now, the problem is that if you ask people, um, would you want money to only go to people who make less money? And by the way, we can't actually do that very well, <laughs> then people would probably be substantially less likely to support means testing. So I think that what you've seen in Republican, at least with Republicans, is that when Trump says something, they tend to adopt those views almost overwhelmingly. I think if we had a Democratic messaging campaign that was really strong and forceful on an issue like means testing and said, look, means testing might sound great, but literally huge percentages of people who are eligible for welfare I just can't get it because of all these means tests. Look at all the bureaucratization. How many of you struggled with unemployment and just couldn't get benefits because of either poorly state administered programs or because of falling through some random means test? These things don't work. We actually can't means test very well at all. And so transitioning to a more universal, more cash based, more federalized welfare program is just better across the board. I think that you'd get a really large portion of the Democratic base to be on board with it. And I think it would resonate with some margin of swing voters that would be a, uh, you know, be an effective uh, message to have. Um, but anyway, any last thoughts on that before we go to SDL's final policy, boys? I, I think one point that I, I'm interested in the Democrats exploring is, given how popular Medicare and Social Security are, and given that our approach tends to be that we should be building out Medicare, we should be like, Medicare's awesome. We take credit for it. Let's make it bigger. Maybe there's something worthwhile to saying, Social Security is great. Don't we want to expand the idea so everybody can really have income security? And yeah. so maybe you want to build out your cash-based benefits out of Social Security programs like SSI, Social Security Income, yeah. Social Security Disability Insurance. And maybe that is the more politically palatable way to actually consolidate programs into um the Social Security Administration, just to build out of programs which already exist there. So that and might be something we want to consider. And it's good that Social Security isn't called like old old people income <laughs> security. Like it's just called Social Security. So the idea that you could use that branding of like Social Security expansion by means of child child benefits, right? Or by means of, um, you know, a, a basic income to all people. Um, it's thematically relatively appropriate as well. Well, it's actually already like sub themed out, right? Because right now, social security checks are old age and disability insurance. Like that's the contributions is what they're called. So like whenever you get a, a, you know, a social security check, it's your old age insurance. If you have a disability, it's your disability insurance. And we can have some like income insurance, right? Yeah. Or like the minimum income, social security minimum income or something like that. I, I think it's a really cool brand. It would make a lot of sense to me. SDL, what's Look, your last- I just last... think society should be secure, okay? I'm just- it's, I'm just a I just, one issue I'm, voter. I'm, I'm just I just believe in national security so much that I extend that to income security as well. Oh, that's, that's right. So anyway, we need that's safe deal. people, safe from poverty. Um, exactly. The the su third suggestion I was going to have: Biden recently proposed, and I, I I and we've previously discussed the SCOTUS reforms that are far more aggressive. But Biden recently proposed three SCOTUS reforms that should just obviously be included in the platform. If Biden, an old coot who is like a super Senate like institutionalist is on board with SCOTUS, uh, with SCOTUS reforms like these, um, then we should just put them into the platform. Absolutely. 
Um, the three that he mentioned were, and I have to pull up the text because I forgot. Um, one, was, that he wants to do a constitutional amendment. So this is not one that really can be like the Senate can just do, but he wants a constitutional amendment that would have no immunity for crimes for a former president that they committed in office. Two is term limits for Supreme Court justices, I believe 18 or 24, I forget which one he proposed. And then a binding code of ethics for the Supreme Court that is enforced by an entity other than the Supreme Court. And I know there was some discussion of which entity that should be. And I think like Sotomayor suggested it should be like the, the district courts, like the courts below the Supreme Court. But leaving aside the question of who should enforce it, these are all like, in my opinion, so common sense that it doesn't even make sense that we need to have a discussion about them. Put them in the platform. Yeah, it's it's almost sus to argue against them, frankly, right? Is like you're you're arguing against the idea that presidents should be held accountable for crimes they committed. You're arguing against the idea that the Supreme Court should have a code of ethics. <laughs> like, really? That's the you want to stake out a position on well, okay. And when fine. you listen to the arguments Republicans have against it, they just say like they're trying to overturn our democracy with far left policies, which is why they need to destroy destroy the Supreme Court. And meanwhile, it's Republicans that de facto packed the Supreme Court. They got lucky with a few deaths and retirements, and they goddamn packed one of the seats. So I don't know. It's just I don't think there's any good arguments about this. And the only reason people get mad about this is because conservatives have power and don't want to lose it. So put it in the platform. I agree 100%. Some sort of Supreme Court reform in the platform is probably reasonable enough. Um, you know, you probably could. And I will propose... say, Biden, I'm pretty sure, poll tested these and only released these because these, after doing those poll testing, which it was like 60% plus majorities, is, is my recollection. So, because the, these are just like the basicest, like most common sense reforms you could you could come up with. None of this is actually like like intrinsically radical, really, if you think about it. Um, Michael, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't have very much thoughts. Partially because yeah. I wasn't paying attention. Oh, <laughs> Unbelievable. he admits it. Unbelievable. Uh, he hears Supreme yeah, well, Court and his brain turns off. Supreme Court reform. I think some basic form of Supreme oh, Court okay. reform. Yeah. They already took a stance on this, but it's good. Obviously, like a binding code of ethics is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that they've taken a strong stance on it. And we should just like beat the drum. I don't think most Americans know. That Clarence Thomas received millions of dollars. I'm so Court. mad. That I, I don't think I've heard Kamala or Walls say that. Just say that this rich asshole is taking shit tons of money from this rich Nazi guy. Just say it. It's the perfect tie in for weird, right? Look at all the paraphernalia he's gotten in his house. That's weird, right? Uh, whatever. Isn't it weird that one of our Supreme Court justices is taking millions of dollars from a Nazi paraphernalia collector? Isn't that just. A little strange, guys. Uh, and yeah. in Miami-Dade County, you can mention that he also collects Soviet artifacts. So it's kind of a win for everything. Wow. Na Nazi and communist? Proving that they're the same thing once and for all. Um, anyway, that's... I mean, I don't have much thoughts on it. We've talked about it before. I think some Supreme Court reform makes sense. Um, any other thoughts that you guys have? There we go. That's it, boys. Well, that's what we would add to the DNC National sort of produced platform there's a lot of good stuff on there and we again this these are all things that we feel like are obviously pretty politically feasible now we're not you know we're not uh play testers we're not messaging experts but i think that there's a a way to message for all of these things either exactly or slightly differently than what we've said today that would be pretty popular and obviously it would result in a lot of good stuff getting extended to the American people, better institutions, better welfare programs, less poverty, more, you know, equality, things like that. Hope you guys enjoyed that topic.